Thank you. Let's do this. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, this panel is How I Love and Hate Tabletop Games. If you thought it was a different panel, you can leave and I won't judge you. The mood will. Uh, yeah, we're. <laughs> you, though, There's more people coming in. They, come on, grab some seats. That's all right. We're waiting. Come on. I'm uh, John Bowling. I'm the senior editor for Tabletop Games at The Escapist, which is escapesmagazine.com. Um, I'm here to moderate this panel, and I'm joined by as much people who are way smarter than I am, uh, including Luke Gray. This is live. Uh, hi, I'm Luke. Uh, I make games mostly really obscure tabletop RPGs. That's it. Oh, that's it? Oh, hey! Okay. <laughs> no one wants to hear me talk about myself. <laughs> Aww. Hi, I'm Donna Pryor. I work for Green Ronin Publishing, and we do tabletop games, and I also work in video games, so um, I play a lot of games. Hi, I'm Christopher Bedell. I own a company called Greater Than Games, and I designed a game called Sentinels of the Multiverse, and another one called Galactic Strike Force, another one called Sentinel Tactics. Oh my god, there's so many games! Uh, yeah, that's me. Go! My name is Rim, I do a podcast, and I review and really hate on a lot of board games, and I tend to spend a lot of my time talking about games at lectures like this, and panels at PAXs. Rim, have you, have you reviewed my games? Panels at PAXs? Uh, I've not yet. Oh, sweet. Good, because I was going to say, you said something terrible, we just finished this now. Adding it to the queue. <laughs> <laughs> so, how many of you, let's just do a show of hands, play table games already? <laughs> How many of you don't play tabletop games at all? No, I can say it. Yeah! We have an audience. <laughs> that was close. Thank you. Did they make you come to this panel? Did your friends drag you here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a ringer. We paid him five bucks to show up. <laughs> so, we're going to kick off by talking a little bit about. I'm sure a lot of you play one kind of game or play another kind of game. Uh, you play one or one game, you play a handful of board games as well. But getting really deep into tabletop is something that can take a lot of time and can be really painful because there's a lot of people that disagree with you. So, what do we do if we play one role playing game, Luke and Donna, and we want to play more? We want to find other games we like. Uh, you're fucked. <laughs> oh, you took first. the first one! You took the first oh, one! Oh, oh, sorry! I first am first person. Sorry. Aww. Uh, how many of you played D&D or Pathfinder? Cool. Uh, how, you, like, those are cool games, right? They're fun. Like, how many of you would, would kind of sometimes wish that your group would play another game once in a while? Yeah. Yay! You all, their panel's done, you get together. Okay, games so together. there we go. <laughs> We're done. Check out Fake One. But there's often the yeah. versus this guy. I know, we can just go talk. About it. So it, it is hard. I mean, when I first started playing back in many, many, many years ago, yeah, don't, don't I couldn't get anybody to. All they wanted to do was play second edition Forgotten Realm. And we went from first to second, and that's all they wanted to play. And I'm like, hey, look at this thing called Spelljammer, it's really awesome. Everybody's like, we don't care. I'm like, look at this thing called Greyhawk. It's really awesome. We don't care. So it is difficult if you are very much to, I only play Pathfinder. I only play this game and this game. You know, And I mean, they've got some really big communities and companies to you know, do that. So how do you support in well, I, indie development? I think a lot of that comes from, I mean, once you start playing a game, you get good and you know the rules and everything. And so when somebody says, hey, we should play this other thing, like, hold on, I know this rule set. And a, and a lot of the responsibility, like w w a great thing about the indie tabletop and a lot of the cool tabletop games out there is they are not as heavy to learn and they are, there's a, a quick and easy way to get into it. And so that's kind of like, if you want to play a different game, take it to your group and be like, guys, we can play in 15 minutes, we can start. I promise you, check this out. And, and I think that's, that's one, of the great, one of the great things about a lot of the cool tabletop RPGs that are out there right now. Yeah. I think there's another factor that if you look, especially back in the D20, like third edition Dungeons and Dragons, D20 uh, system era, a lot of people would say, oh, I'm dissatisfied with, say, Dungeons & Dragons, and they want to play a different game because, like, the story they're telling doesn't really fit with the mechanics of the game, or they're having some problem. But if they just went to the game store and looked at the pile of games that are there, they're different role-playing games, while they were all very different, like Palladium books and all these different systems, GURPS, mechanically they worked similarly, either very similarly or similar enough to where there wasn't enough of an advantage. Like, switching didn't buy them enough to be worth the effort. 
and there was no way for them to find the game that was starkly different. The game that actually let them play, they're like, the elves are having a dinner party for four hours and we don't want to roll dice during this. Yeah, I mean, and, and bringing up with some of the, uh, the other systems is that a lot of people are really into the world and not necessarily the game setting. So how do you get somebody to maybe try a different game setting, uh, you know, but, but stick to the same rules, rule set, like fate and icons and things like that, where you can, which is kind of what GURPS was doing, really, you know, is that here's your rules, but let's have this world that we love and just do a different system. So last thing before we move on, because this is a bifurcated panel, a black and white panel. I also want to say that we immediately jump to like, oh, how do we change? How do we move away from this? But it is totally cool to love a game system so much that you never, ever want to play another game. Like, that is great. Like, you're, you should be so happy uh, if that's your thing. Like, if you have found something that you love so dearly that this is it, you're fulfilled for, the, you know, the imaginable future, lucky you. I right. would play classic Deadlands, and that was, that, I would play that game like every week. If yeah. I could, if I had my druthers, I would play that game, Classic Deadlands, all the time. I love it. So, and then, I mean, but the other side of that is, if you know somebody who loves that game, don't be mad at them because they love a game and they don't want to play your stupid game. <laughs> <laughs> I think that friction, though, comes from people who love a game and their friends love a game, but there's something that bothers them about it and it's very hard for them to find a way to fix that thing over time, like that grows like the ring in someone's pocket until eventually they go crazy and they decide they hate D&D when actually they love 90% of D&D and they start hating their friends who don't want to play a different system. Just because of grapple rules. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, the kind of uh, flip side of the same coin where you don't see the same problems board games specifically. <laughs> Not card games, though. Mm. I think you do see it in board you games. You do see it a you lot of board games. I mean, sometimes, right? So you see people who really love to play diplomacy. I'm, I know group. I know groups of people. I like my friends. I hope they like only play deck building games. Nobody games, games like Dominion. That is it. That is their Dungeons and Dragons. They play deck building games. That is literally all they care about. Their friends are like, hey, let's play this Canizia game or let's play this card. Game. Like, no, we only play deck building games. Are you talking about Scott? <laughs> <laughs> Scott only plays Netrunner. <laughs> no, but John, John is absolutely correct. Like in general, the the general sort of truth is that like an RPG group is going to find an RPG and stick with that for a long time because they're doing an ongoing campaign and they're playing for long periods of time, whereas a board game group is going to be like they're going to get together once a week or once a month or whatever, and they're going to be like, okay, what board games are we busting out tonight? And a good board game group has a library of games. That library could be three games, it could be 17 games, it could be two walls, you know, right? But, um, but, the, but generally, board gamers want all the board games. And RPG gamers want to find an RPG, and then maybe expand out in a couple different ones. But like the RPG group is going to get together and be like, "Oh, are we going to do you know Burning Wheel tonight, or are we going to do Fate Core?" And it's like, "No, you knew what you were coming to. You were going to be playing your character and the story that we've been playing for the last three months, and you really hope you get the thing that you were trying to get for the last three months." Which don't get. So, so, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just curious, actually. I love my audience pools, I, I, and I log them all scientifically. I take pictures with my mind. Um, so uh, you all said like everyone except for, <laughs> except for that guy. Everyone except for that guy. So you just keep your hand down. Um, you all said that you play uh, tabletop games. So how many of you play multiple tabletop games in a night, like on game night? Cool. Does anyone play just like one giant war game on game night? <laughs> yeah. Do you have to be like a risk night or a warhammer People, night? Four like yeah. yeah. X. Yeah. 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 Twilight Imperium. <laughs> you know, Arkham. Man, anyway, I, so, I love Arkham War, but I don't often have 16 hours and four dining room tables. Right. <laughs> so, but it, it's just a, it's an interesting divide um, and an interesting perception and about uh, board games where right, we'll sit down and, and churn through multiple uh, systems in a night, but with RPGs, we're much more proprietary and, and clingy to our How many people level. actually play RPGs and not board games? Well, and not oh, or, yeah. or, I mean, RPGs is your, your big thing. No, who, yeah. Who, yeah, who here considers right. themselves okay. primarily an RPG player? Oh, wait, all right, so wait. Hey, hey! That guy's hand is up. Yay! So what do you play? Hold on, you, you're now the most important person in this family. <laughs> what, what, you say you're an RPG player, what do you play? It just depends if it Great, Yay! cool. What's the last thing you played, the most recent thing you played? Skyrim? I heard this Witcher 2. Like Witcher 2? Dark Souls? Okay, cool. So already, look at what we have the problem with. Yeah, when we say role-playing game, everyone, some people think Final Fantasy, some people think Burning Wheels. Everyone thinks a role-playing game is a different thing. So already. Excuse me, young man, we're talking about tabletop. That's okay. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think, I think that's really important. Um, those entry points, yeah. right? What, yeah. are, what are our entry points for getting more of your friends into tabletop games? Uh, well, 
you know, a good example for me is because I do so many demos of Dragon Age tabletop, and uh, who knows that there is a Dragon Age tabletop role-playing game in this room? I love you, people! Yay. Who loves the Dragon Age video games? I'm doing a demo from two to four today. <laughs> so, uh, but I get a lot of people converted who have never played tabletop. Um, they are, you know, they're like, oh my god, I have to have all these books, and they don't realize that a lot of people are making games that are very accessible and easy to get into, and so Dragon Age is easy because they have a, a frame of reference. So if I said, oh, I've got this game that you love, and it's very story-driven, blah, we got a tabletop, let me show you how to do this, and then they fall in love with tabletop games. So I have an interesting experience with, the, with like Dragon Age tabletop games, and that for me, I'm like, well, there's video games, there's board games, and by me, I mean like me in the past. I was like, well, there's video games, there's board games, and they don't really go together, because a lot of the board games that were made off of video games were kind of bad. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And um, and so, but the thing that's great is that with Dragon Age, when you play the Dragon Age video game, you know what the feel of the world is. You know what the feel of the people is. You're like the feel, the presence of the game is very. There's there's a cohesive feeling to that game. And so when you approach the uh, the tabletop of the, um, RPG, it's like, oh, this feels like that. And that sort of feeling is really good. And that's one thing that I think a lot of um, RPG groups, a lot of tabletop RPG groups, can take to heart. Is like, hey, establish a feeling. And then the system that you're playing is not nearly as important as the feeling that you're creating. I would argue the exact opposite. Yes! The feeling, <laughs> in my experience, the feeling that happens, both in board, like ortho games, like competitive board games and role-playing games, the mechanics drive that, yep. and the only time that's not the case is if everyone playing the game is very charismatic, very good at telling stories, and they sort of gloss over the rules. The, the mechanics themselves, like a really good example, there's a tabletop RPG called Dread. It's, you know, you, you play like a survival horror thing. Some people know this. So it's a survival horror game. Like, we're trying to survive the zombie apocalypse and save people and whatever. But it's like a horror movie. One by one, characters are dying. Conflict resolution is not rolling dice. It's not playing paper, rock, scissors, or doing your whatever stuff. It's a Jenga tower. Yes. I love this game. You do a pull, and you do a pull, and you'll see that the Jenga tower gets more and more unstable. Tension builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. And, builds. and then someone knocks it over. And the rules say that that character then dies in the most horrific scene appropriate way possible. <laughs> Just like a horror movie. So I don't need to be a script writer. I don't need to be charismatic. I don't need to know how to tell a story. The physical reality of the game, the rules of the game, trick me into telling the story I wanted to tell, even if I'm terrible at telling stories. I, I think, though, that the, the, uh, I think the genre or... Like the color of a game is so important. I, I don't care whether it's it's a tabletop game or RPG or whatever. I mean, uh, I, I just see it like that's the hook. That's the initial hook for us all. Is like, oh well, that sounds like an interesting world for me to mess around in, in for a little while. Uh, uh, and I, like, anybody play Command and Colors? Uh, any of that stuff? Like, yeah, my that's right. My people. there's no one over there. So good. I'm glad none of you play Command and Colors. Um, uh, so it's designed by Richard Borg, Memoir Forty Four, and mm -hmm. other games. Uh, and they're very, they're, they're crazy. They're simple, fast play war games. They combine things like war and fun, which is crazy. Uh, so uh, my favorite iteration of it is the Napoleonics version. I love it. And, and uh, you know, I love these games and I'm a game designer and blah, blah, blah. So I, I tend to look at games for their mechanics. But I know that if I told my friend that, uh, hey, we're gonna play this amazing war game with these really deep mechanics, uh, you can make squares of bunnies because it's bunnies versus <laughs> birds. Bunnies versus birds. Uh, then he would not play that game. But as soon as I said, hey, Richard Borg has a new uh, Napoleonics game out, he was like, where can I buy it? He actually went and bought his own set of it because he was so excited. <laughs> because it's the, it, the hook there is the genre. Uh, and it's so, so much uh, like the initial step. And I mean, if the game was bad, obviously he wouldn't play it because he's, he's very discerning about these things too. Uh, the game is unfortunately very good, uh, but yeah, like as, as our first gateway, like you have to love the color of the game. But then yeah. I guess it's if the mechanics don't support that color, then it goes from this initial interest to extreme dislike. Sure, I've seen that happen. Yeah. I think that's the that's what I was sort of trying to get at. That yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why we we hate licensed games so much is because we're like, love this thing. This is the worst design thing ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, when you when you go from like, oh man, I love Star Wars to this game, and actually, I'm not thinking of a specific Star Wars game. Um, Star Wars D20. It was okay. D and D rules plus some stuff about ships. Like the proper nouns are all shifted. And lightsabers. There were lightsabers. Yeah, you know what? They did about as much damage as a longsword. Right. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, well, you know, it's, it's funny you put the mechanics because um, game mechanics will turn me off to, um, 
You know, I love, 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 love the world of Shadowrun, but my hands are not large enough to hold that many dice. Come on, it's like 40 D6. And I hate math, which is why I'm not a game designer. Um, But yeah, the story, but you're right, the story is exactly what hooks me in. And if I don't like the mechanics, I put them to a system I do like. And (laughs) something I can teach other people. Right, we've broached into talking about complexity. How do you find the games that fit your play style? Say, your friends really only like to play cards against you. I'm sure some people are in that boat. Find your friends. <laughs> your friends are great. Well, you know, I don't think it's about complexity. I think it's, there's, I think there's a, another thing at play here. There's basically multiple reasons why we like playing games. Does anyone in this room simply play games because they like hanging out with their friends? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, game night is a fun time. It's better than going to a bar. It's better than going to a movie. Let's play uh, games it's, in a bar. It's cheaper in general than all of those things. Uh, but right, I think there's a, like there's a higher level. It's a social activity. activity. What's it? It's a social activity. It's a social activity. Yeah. And it's, it's a great social activity. Uh, and then there's the getting hooked into the game for its complexity. Right. And then the, like the opposite of playing games because you like to play with your friends is like playing diplomacy. <laughs> you're, you're playing games because you hate your friends. So. Oh, or oh, you. Are you trying to let somebody go with the, you know in a passive aggressive manner? So hey, let's play diplomacy. <laughs> um, but 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 no, you're absolutely correct. We're like. The point of playing it, and this is one of the reasons that I primarily make cooperative games, is the point, for a large point of playing games is, is a group activity that we're all doing together, and cooperative games can fill that very well, and RPGs fill that very well, where it's like, hey, we're all doing a thing together, and at the end of the night, it was, oh my god, you talk a little bit about, remember the time I rolled the natural 20, but you talk more about, remember the time this story thing happened, and the mechanics were just supporting that story. I mean, if you follow Will Eaton, you know, Axe Tackle? I mean, everybody knows Axe Tackle and Dragon Age just from that big session that came out of Dragon Con, and it was really funny. So you, you get those stories, you know. They can be in tabletop, in role playing, or card, you know, card games and, and whatnot. Um, you know, you can take picture stuff, put it on Twitter, and start conversations of people that want to get involved and play, you know, that kind of thing. But you've got to be aware of why, not just why you're like, you're playing games to hang out with your friends, but you've got to be like one more level aware if you really want to find a gaming group that'll be strong and play the kinds of games you want to play, or however you want to do it. You have to know why you're playing the game on another level. Are you playing the game because you want to test each other's skill, figure out who's the best at this game? Are you really focused on the competition? Are you trying to tell a story? Do you want a game that's just context for your social interaction? And that is the biggest sticking point in gaming groups. People play Cards Against Humanity to break the ice. Not many people play Cards Against Humanity to win. Or, or for the mechanics. How do you give or do you agree? Uh, what's really easy is that um, I just bring games and I say, this is what we're playing. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, that, the alpha gamer is, is definitely a thing. I do the same thing in my group, too. Like, my uh, people ask me all the time, like, you know, how do you get your group to play tests? And I say, well, they're dumb, and none of them want to be the game master, so yeah. I just say, this is what we're doing this week. And they go, but, 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 and I say, okay, you run a game. And they say, uh, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, and not to be the cynical one, but I've found that I have different circles of friends depending on what type of game I want to play. The indie RPGs I play, I play with this one set of people, and there's overlap, but there are people who just don't overlap. If I come to PAX, I want to play, like, my for real, like, we're going to play Puerto Rico or Tigers and Euphrates ten times in a row with, with all experts. We go hide in the corner, like, around from tabletop and just wall ourselves off and play with that little group. And then we go back and join everyone else. I form a different gaming group for every type of game I want to play. Yeah. And I mean, that makes a lot of sense that that's, that's fairly self-selecting, and that if you have somebody in your gaming group, and they're like, man, this is just not the game for me, like, ah, because this is not the game for you, I think I know what the game for you might be. But look at the problem this causes. I'm now off the radar if there's someone who totally likes to play the kind of games I like. There's almost no way for us to bump into each other. That's true. So there are wonderful two, ways. two questions. <laughs> would, uh, would any of you play a game with, uh, that you really don't like with your friends? Like, just to play it? Like, no. Would, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> I would <laughs> never know. <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't. No, no. Actually, I, I have... I won't name the Except game, risk. but I was Me so too. angry. I was angry at a game mechanic. I was angry at this game. And everybody was having fun, and then they started making fun of me because I was angry. I flipped the table. No lie. Literally, 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 I flipped the table in my own house. I flipped my own table. Did you put it back? So those no, I made them clean it up. They need to make a table that's designed to be flippable. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Where all the pieces just Geek stay chic. on it. Let's get on Geek Chic and you know, hey guys, can you make this table? We just flip around. Get on this. It'd be a great thing. So, 
Sorry. <laughs> can kind of establish right that most of the time your friends are going to play the game with you, right? And they're going to try it once. Um, let's talk about teaching games to people a little bit. I, Madonna, I think you have something to say. You're on point now. Yay! So that is that is, that is people, you teach people to flip tables. I, <laughs> no, because I play in public, and I would never do that to anybody who owned a public, like a store or a cafe or a pub. I want to come back and I want to drink their delicious beers. So um, actually, my whole thing, why I started my meetup group, and I've been doing it in different cities as I go from game company to game company, you know, because that's what you do um, in video games, is that I established that this is a meetup that's specifically for people who have never played games, board games, um, who like beer, because we, we try to do beer geek, because it makes it more social and comfortable for people to kind of come in and look at stuff and then leave if they don't feel comfortable. And, um, like that guy. Like that guy. <laughs> Shaming him. Goodbye. Shaming <laughs> We're talking about the panel. You're the nice guy. You're staying. You're, you're all so teaching about. games. So teaching games. So, so my thing is, that's my, I know, I know, I go on track. But um, I don't sit down and play during my meetup. I host. So I welcome everybody who comes in the door. And this is something I'm actually very critical about gaming groups and people that host friendly things. And then you never know who's in charge. And it's really difficult to go in. Or, you know, as a woman, it can be difficult going into a space. So what I do is make them really, really welcoming and, and I just say, hey, what kind of games to play? Well, I've never played a board game. Here, let me teach you this. And a lot of people come in and they're just like, well, I don't know how to, I don't know any of these games. And I'm like, neither do we. We just bought them. Let's all learn how to play them. And that's so what we did. So for you, the hosting is more important than the teaching. Uh, yeah. And then if there's like somebody who comes in, I'm like, hey, I got this real cute two-person thing. Well, you can wait till there's another space open in this game. And they're like, oh, okay. And then I just go grab a game and we sit down and play. And then I get to know them, get to know what kind of games that they like and then try to hook them up and work with other meetup groups and other game stores. And uh, I'm here local, so it's easy to do at Cafe Mox. And we take over the back rooms. So there's, we have our own space where we can, and all my people that are hardcore gamers that consider themselves hardcore, that play like every night of the week, they love teaching games. So you have a group, love, you have a group, I have you have, really you have a group of teachers. I have a group host. of teachers and I manage them. And sure. Them. Yeah. So for people who uh, don't want to be that resource, uh, meetup.com is a really great place to go. That's my favorite place. I've been on Meetup since 2002, and it's a really great source of finding game groups because you can show up at different locations and just kind of see if it's a good fit for you. Um, also, you can go to your friendly local gaming store or gaming pub or gaming tavern or things like that. Those things are becoming more and more popular. We have some representatives of the audience from one of my favorites, 42 Lounge. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> anyway. You should tell me more. Right. They're pretty cool. You should talk to them. Anyway, so, uh, but you go to your friendly local gaming store and there is, and you might find out that this may be not the store that has this sort of thing, but a lot of stores run events and they have groups of people that have got a cork board that just put a piece of paper saying, hey, we're looking for another player. Worst case scenario, you play with them one time and go, this group wasn't for me. Best case scenario, you make a new group of friends. So, you know, there's, there's lots of, so the, the going to your local gaming store and finding those, finding those things is kind of the offline retro version of Meetup. Right, that's the way we used to do it, is yeah. that you, there's a sticky but, board so yeah, people no, so there's, put there's, stuff up there. So they still do. I think that, um, Rim, was something you wanted to add there? Or, uh, I'm gonna, no, you, you can go. I'm, I'm going to. I was going to say something really mean, so I'm just going to back yeah. off. Uh, <laughs> you sure? Uh, well, we, so we have a talk at the last PAX East. We called it Why No One Will Game With You. And <laughs> not, not to go off, but I found that, in, at least in my experience, in the experience of a lot of people, like you do a very good job, it sounds like. Like you, have, you, know, you engage. You have, a, like, you have people who come to a gaming group, have a good experience, they're set up with something. Most open gaming meetups I've seen, the people who engage first tend to be the kinds of people that gaming is notorious for having. And I found that people go to those events, and if they find someone they can game with, they leave, secretly exchange like contact info, and then meet up in an apartment like the next week, and they never go back to that event again. Yep. So those gaming. places, like the mechanism design of that is that it's like a hawk dove problem. Over time, it's all those people. Like the percentage of those people are, it's like osmosing into a concentration. A lot of gaming meetups seem to, in my opinion, be the worst places to find. Oh, I've got, a, I've got a story to support that. Uh -oh. I was, when I was in San Diego, I was like, oh, look at this game group. It's right where, near right where I work when I was working for SOE. And I was like, this would be really great. And I went in there, and there was a man that was running it. And um, every woman that was there, he would come up while they were playing games and massage their shoulders. Oh, good. 
Why is it always that? Why is it that specific? Like, hey. And there was one guy. I never get one guy. All he wanted to do was play Munchkin. We and are, there's nothing that, wrong with that. That's that great. But he was mean about it. Yeah. And he that's the difference. Shady. He was mean about it. And he's like, well, what, you know, what, was, what do you got a problem with Munchkin? And I was like... Well, I mean, I think this actually comes down to like what you choose to do when you're teaching yeah. games and you're playing games. I make cooperative games and I play cooperative games because I know that when I'm playing a competitive game, I'm a really competitive player and I right. like rending the lifeblood of my opponents. <laughs> <laughs> and so I made cooperative games so I could play with my friends. Right. Well. <laughs> so this, this is exactly it. So we exist right now, all of us, you and I and everyone here exist in the golden age of gaming. There has never, ever on earth been a time Time like this where there's so many games to play so many options you can game every second of the day uh, through multiple mediums it's fucking amazing I don't want to interject and say number two my list of board games board games that came out this year as over 500 titles Ooh, right so it, this is amazing uh, but we have a problem we are terrible like even though like the, it's the, the gaming medium is so compelling that it it works anyway, and we want to play these games, we get so interested, but we are awful at teaching one another how to play games or, or inviting one another into our groups. Uh, Role-playing gamers are notorious for this, but I've seen the same thing in board games, so, where you sit down and the, uh, your group has a complete subtext to it. Your group has in-jokes, your group has ga favorite games, your, uh, your group knows, this guy knows the rules, there's all these, uh, you know, all these lovely things that make your group work. When new players come in, uh, they don't know any of this stuff, and they are just completely alienated by all your dumb jokes uh, and your you know, your weird snacks and all, all this other. And this stuff. isn't even intentional. We're not talking about the creepy guy. This yeah, is no, this like is, no, this like yeah. socialization. This is, this These is are like functional people that that are have jobs and take showers and, and uh, <laughs> like have have been to see a movie in the last year. Like uh, <laughs> like totally like. You and my friends. These are my friends. <laughs> Charisma is not friends. their dumb stat. Your, your friends you know? have really weird snacks. Uh, we, we did. We, we got did some weird snacks. snacks. Oh, I um, cook for all the ones at my house, so I'm so, like, sure. So one of the things that I found was really important uh, as the, um, so the occasional alpha dog and my friends is to kind of break the ice up, like the, the iceberg, the ice flow. I'm, that's right. I'm melting the glaciers. Uh, so, uh, and you play a new game. Play it, When you have new people there, play a game that none of you have ever played before. Right? And don't Put play you all on equal footing. Don't play like pandemic or something where <laughs> one person is just gonna be the general. But that uh, is not a co-op game. Uh, yeah, pa pandemic no, it's solitaire is, with other people holding Flashpoint. Yeah. I like Flashpoint. Flash, Flash, Flash yeah, yeah great Flashpoint's game. great for, see, for putting people in. Seriously, play create an experience. Invite new people over, test them out, see if they're worthy to be part of your group. <laughs> um, and but play, do things, get new snacks. Right? Break everybody's habits. Mix it up. Invite, you know, try, try to do it on a night when, like, your super alpha friend is busy. Uh, and then, so that the peop new people can be comfortable when he or she shows up. Well, like a specific time. example. You have, a, you know, you have your weird inside joke. Uh, you haven't told the story of where that came from in ten years. And there's someone new. This is the opportunity to explain that inside joke and tell that funny story. That story's not as funny as you think it is. <laughs> Unless you're the group that tells that story every week, and then maybe don't. That's my maybe. I mean, you know, because I'm doing this from the perspective of somebody who's been trying to play games and been told as a woman that, like, even in high school, that women don't play games, women don't play RPGs, women don't play Dungeons and Dragons, women don't play miniatures games, and all this. And I still fight this, and still women come to my meetups and to come to my panels about this and uh, tell me they tried to join, you know, a game, and everybody was kind of, what do you mean you don't know the rules? And I, I, it's just really hard, oh, here's a cleric. By the way, if any of you people ever do that, and you're like, oh, you're the woman, you're somebody's girlfriend or spouse, and you give them the cleric, I will come to your house and punch you. I'll be right there holding it. You know what? <laughs> and I love playing clerics. I like playing clerics. And I really love playing clerics, but I don't like that me default too. of somebody just handing me the cleric because... I, you know, as opposed to me being a barbarian or, you know, like a The funny thing is when, it, a when, a, when a new person shows up, fighter. regardless of their gender or persuasion or anything like that, I hand them a DPS. I'm like, okay, you're going to be dumb and just go stab things. Go, go stab. Go Are you stab saying things. they're dumb? Yes. <laughs> no. I love, yeah, I like to have stabby things. Right. Like, no, don't get us wrong. It's my character's name is Stabitha. 
you know, so. <laughs> now it's totally okay to want to have the occasional, like, we're all experts playing our expert game thing. Like, I, like, it's okay to have a gaming group and someone says, hey, can I play that game? And to say, hey, do you already know the rules? We're playing one game of this where, like, we're all super serious and hardcore and you probably wouldn't have fun. But we have to be honest about that. You can't be the jerk about it. it's like, no, go away. Or like, no, you're not smart enough to play this game. So it's okay to say, I'm going to, we're playing this game now, a non-teaching game. We'll run a teaching game later. Come back in like an hour and we'll be here. How many of you would characterize your group as a group that plays like the really hardcore expert game every week? You. How many of you are expert gamers? One, two, three. Okay. So, so uh, okay, so hold on. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to follow up on that. How many of you, can, when you play games, more than half of the time, there is a new person in the group that you're playing with. More frequently than the expert gamers. Hmm. <laughs> How many of you have never played a game on expert advanced elite mode? How many of you have never cared to? Well, never cared to. You don't want to play the nine hour game of Twilight. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, right. That's fine. That's when like three meals, man. When are we going to try and do it? When are we going to try and do it? An hour and a half? Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, so other than the funness of raising hands and stuff, that's interesting and important because it's like, okay, like, so generally, and this is, this is fairly indicative of, of most uh, tabletop crowds that I've seen, is that there's, it's more about, like we said earlier, playing with your group of friends, and then sometimes you get that tight group together and that tight group does a thing, but most gaming groups are about, hey, this is a group of people that actually get along pretty well, and maybe there's that one guy who's kind of a dick, but we still like him. Um, uh, but, um, and yet, okay, good, great. Um, but the group is about the fellowship, and then finding new games to play, and throwing new stuff at the table, and that can be new RPGs, and it can be new t card games, it can be new board games. And so a lot of it comes back to what we talked about earlier, is teaching games. There's a lot of game teaching going on, and what seems to be the best thing um, or at least a good thing is doing a game that not one person teaching. We're like, oh, I'm the expert. I'll teach you all. No, it's better to be just, hey, let's get a game we've never played before. So if you're looking for a way to, to bust up your gaming group in some way, um, in a good way, not bust up as in ruin, um, yeah. get a game that none of you have ever played before, yeah. and that you don't read the rules in advance. Yeah. Say, hey, this looks interesting to me, and it also kind of looks dumb and weird, but the cover art's cool. So let's get it. Let's all read the rule book together. And you know what? Even if you don't really like the game by the end of it, you'll probably have an experience that's enjoyable. And even if it ends with throwing the game over your shoulders. Yeah. Do it. Don't flip it. Okay. If you uh, do want to break the game, really you're probably brought this up. Diplomacy is the game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. What, I love seriously? It. I love it. It's the best game ever. Yeah, no, right. Also, you don't want to have friends at the end. Luke, do you want to play Diplomacy? Too? Yeah, let's play Diplomacy while playing Twilight Imperium. Let's play Diplomacy right now. Okay, who's, who's Russia? Okay. okay. <laughs> Turkey. So, uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, now that you know, you're know you in the gaming community, and this is another case for a lot of people, um, how do you learn to talk about games so that you can talk to the people who like the games you like, so that you can find the new games that you enjoy? I, there's some words I really hate, some names that I really hate that people use all the time that are true things and are useful and we should talk about them. But like, let's, a lot of times you, you get a brand new person coming in and it's like, hey, check out this game. It's a deck building game. What the hell does that mean? This game. a great story about the term deck building game. Cryptozoic is a company that makes a lot of deck building games. Made the NHL, so that's the hockey deck building game. The National Hockey League, I believe you And they uh, sold the crap out of it in Canada. <laughs> Surprising, just no, no one. Shocker. And they took it to the NHL draft because it was part of their license. And they set out, and you know, they're the only import game in 100 miles. Right. And there's moose. There they are. And people walk up and they want to play the game. They're like, oh, look, there's a card game. I'm not going to play the card game. So it's interesting. It's like poker, and like, there's a deck building game. And then that person walks away immediately. Because they just said a thing they've never heard before and they're don't like, understand. And what I'm like, I'm going to put my house. Like, <laughs> Counterpoint. This is this movie is film noir. What right. is a black movie? Like, like if someone isn't familiar with that lexicon, we right. use these lexicons in every other medium. No, no, no. But, a, but that's but that's fine. But you don't say to someone, hey, you've never seen a movie ever before. Come to my house and watch a film noir movie. I'm sorry, what? Like, if you have somebody that you're getting, if you like, we said there are so many people to raise their hands on how many times you're playing with a new player. You're playing with a new player. 
Like, let's let's not use words like we're replacing. Well, I think we need to use the words so that people learn the lexicon. Yeah, but after you play the game. There's competition to be, hey, it's a deck building game. What's a deck building game? Oh, a deck building game, and then explain the term. Sure, but I've seen so many gaming groups say to people, hey, we've got these games. Do you want to play a deck building game, or do you want to play a uh, cooperative game, or do you want to play a uh, word replacement game? And they go, I thought we were playing board games. What the hell did you just say? <laughs> yeah, I, I usually just describe the game itself. Like, let's yeah. say uh, Flashpoint is the example. We're all fire peoples, and we're trying to save the peoples and the doggies and the kitties. It just be fun, and we do this all together. And you get and to drive a fire truck. And we get to drive a fire truck. And they're like, that sounds really fun. I was like, I know, right? Let's play. That's exactly how it yeah, But it, it really depends. Like, you have to understand, you know, a lot of nerds and geeks... Like, we lose sight of who we're talking to. Like, if I'm describing a game to my gaming group, I say things like, oh, this is a political ortho game. Sure. Yeah. But if I'm describing it to a stranger, I'll use that terminology, but like, read social cues. If the person obviously, like, doesn't immediately, like, rock what you're saying, explain the term without waiting for them to get confused and frustrated. Sure, I think it's important to note that, as you said, read social cues. One of the big stereotypes that is not untrue about gamers, myself included many times, is that reading social cues is not as necessarily as important as being super passionate about stuff. The thing that nerds and geeks are about is good at is being super passionate, and often I'll be super excited about say, explaining something, and somebody said, yeah, like six sentences ago you said a thing, and since then it's just been like, ooh, acid trip words. Well, so, <laughs> nothing, I'm gonna be blunt, nothing scares me away from someone who's like, I don't know, like, hey, can I play games with the con? Like, if their exuberance level is above a certain line, like, I am very rapidly making up an excuse to get out of there. <laughs> but, so, that's why I would say, like, you know, just be, be, be prepared to start with the use the dumb words and be like, oh yeah, I got it, okay, cool, then ramp it up. But because like rather than, I mean, it, it's good to be, it's easy to, to be more inclusive and if somebody says, look, I know all about those words. It's like, oh great, now we can step it up. I, the next I find that we really, as a, as a culture, we just fucking talk too much. Um, <laughs> but so you're, you're, <laughs> you're, like, our, your passion is, uh, is infectious. Like totally be excited about your games, like spit on the person's glasses that uh, you're so excited about them. Like, it's, it's cool. But then just shut up and play the game. I'm serious. Just, like, bust the game out, show your excitement, and don't explain all the rules to the game, because I will hurt you. Um, there's nothing... Like, I play a fair amount of games. Rim plays a lot of games. I play a fair amount of games, and I am so bored the moment you start describing the rules to me. I am instantly bored, yep, because absolutely. I play enough games where I will get it. If, you, if we start walking through a turn structure, I'll get it. So please, be excited. Tell me how awesome your game is or your new favorite game or whatever it is. I really, I actually really do want to hear. But then just let's play the fucking game. Yeah. You know, I, I'm I sorry actually, the people who do that, who love to read everything ahead, I just say, here, this is Istanbul. I hear it's fantastic. Tell me how to play it. And then I hand it off to somebody and then they come back and they go, oh, well, it's really cool. It brings all these styles in. I think that you're going to like it. And I was like, okay, well, tell me why I would like it. And, you know, to talk about why they think it's a great game, not, oh, it won this award. Like, but again, it, like, it comes back to, yeah. you have to know who you're talking to, like, be social, and, like, really, what are you there for? Are you there to play a game and hang out? Then play the game. Hang out. But a lot of people, like, res resist playing games that seem really hard, really complex, or really tabletop-y because of that rule thing. Because someone like me is going to start explaining these rules, like, this is a cube, this is a double cube. This is an ortho cube. They move orthogonally, on, and I start explaining everything. Now, that is all that is all I want. If someone's teaching me a game, that is literally what I want them to do to me, because I'm a very different person. But if I start to do that to someone, and I see Luke like pulling out the pistol and loading it up, and, like I know to Tell back up. I take my first turn, <laughs> now, I, I actually had somebody do that up in the sixth floor the expo hall to me. Is they started? They actually started a. Um, you know, I was like, oh, hey, you know, I'm going to go do a panel. I can't stay to do demo. I'm doing a panel about loving and hating tabletop. And they're just like, oh, so you want to learn how to play tabletop games? And I was like, no. And they started explaining at a very juvenile level about what their game was. And I'm like, can you just give me the quick one, please? And they're like, what? Well, that's the... And that's, you know, it's just like, it's that whole thing. I'm like, can you give me the, the quick spiel about your game? And, you know... Well, we're all guilty like, of this. Yeah, you know, we're talking about... So, yeah. again, the social cues, we... A lot of nerds and geeks and people who are excited, you've queued up a bunch of words that you're gonna say. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what the, like someone says, hey, I'm looking for my lost dog. Yeah, this is a deck building game. <laughs> Speaking of uh, going to the nursery that no one really wanted to hear, um, how about joining the online community for games? Because 
What people say about your game online is incredibly important. The majority of reviews for your game are going to be from people who have sat down and played it. Reviews are terrible. They're all wrong. They're bad. I hear reviews. And it, since every review then is wrong, how do you write a review that is correct? Or is going to find someone who's going to be like, oh, I, this review makes sense to me. Has anyone this. written a review of a game? Even just like a one paragraph on Board Game Geek or anything like that. Has anybody done that in here? A red Written, 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 written one. Just, okay. Has, has anyone read a review on Yeah, does anybody read? Has anybody gone to the website Born Game Geek and it is able to fully parse exactly how that website works? <laughs> Can we talk after this? I have like, no idea. idea. Can you help us out here? Because like, I'm like, ah. Uh... And I'm like, you know what I want to see? I like it, this is why I like it. I don't like it, this is why I don't like it, but that doesn't mean it's, you know. There's I a mean, section on the website you can get to that says that. I rather get that with Beer Advocate, you know. Beer Advocate, it's like, it lists like this, and, I'm, and I'll write up there, it's like, I really like this, this was really cool and refreshing, you guys so, should try it. And yeah, then people are like, oh, well, uh, you know, maybe you just don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, Well, I hate reviews that have any sort of like, I liked it, I didn't like it, I want to see this kind of person would like this game. Yeah. Right. Well, you like these kinds of things. If you like this, you'll like right. that. That's the part. Because to say this kind of person like this game, like who the hell are you to say this kind of person will like this game? Um, but the, the the I like it, I don't like it thing is not quite as useful. This game reminds me of this other game, and also like this game plays like this. This game feels like this. And whereas that person, it's going to be different for every person. If you read 17 reviews and 14 of them say this game feels a, w a certain way, then that sounds attractive to you. That's useful information. But when people say, I don't like this game, and thus it is a bad game, <laughs> like, that's great, very useful, strong. Even yeah, just saying something's a bad game is usually a mis- like, it's like almost the and laziest yes. thing, like, this is a good game or a bad game is the laziest thing you can say. You basically said nothing. Yeah. So, the, 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 the fiddly words, the fiddly is another term, but, the, the, so, fiddly. if I, All basically, the, this gets applied to my games and a lot of my friends' games, uh, it, so if you ever see this, these two words in a game review, you know, the person's no idea what you're talking about. Unless you've said it yourself, and then I'm going to tell you you have no idea what you're talking about. Um, it, it's a needlessly complex, fiddly game. Needlessly complex. <laughs> it's as complex as it needs to be to work. Stop it. Yeah. So as soon as you see a review or anybody saying this game is needlessly complex, they're being dismissive. They're not being honest. They're not talking about what the game does or why they like it or why they even don't like it. They're just having an emotional response. Uh, if you've ever, I hope that, that those people have said that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so I'm so that you know people are like, listen. I think this panel needless, is needlessly like, complex. Is my favorite this panel word. Is word. Oh god, I hate it. Well, it's like yeah, we're bouncing off that and kind of like with that that whole complexity thing is that I teach people who are brand new and people tell me I should never do this. I teach them Small World huh? because it's a it's a gorgeous, wonderful game to teach people and that people can understand strategy and, and things like that. And if you explain it with the Say, oh, it's well, it's kind of like it's like a cartoon version of Access and Allies. Well, that made me never want to play the game. You know, I was just like, oh, I don't have the time for that. And this is not a game that takes a long time. And when somebody said, oh, well, you know, here's how it is. This is why I like it. And this is the, you know, these are what you do in the game. Then I'm like, oh, well, it doesn't sound like Access and Allies at all. It just happens to be, you know, when you get too caught on genre. Mm -hmm. you know, of, of this. And so I actually teach that to brand new people. And a lot of times they win because they get when I'm like. You know, don't worry about, you know, I mean, I so how I play these games with people, like with you guys, would be totally different how I would play it with new people. I think something that's yeah. interesting is that we're talking about, like, reviews, and we said at the beginning, you know, who here, who here has written a review, and there's, like, very few hands, because and people say, a lot of you are going, so why are you guys talking to us about how to write a review? We're never going to do that. But, a few minutes ago, we said, how many of you played with brand new people? And a lot of hands went up. So you've all reviewed games for people before, because when you're, you're going to play with a brand new person, you're like, hey, here's what I like about this game, here's this, how this game feels, here's this and that and the other. That's game reviews. You may not be writing them down, you may not be a journalist, whatever, who cares? You're doing game reviews. And game reviewing, is, there's, this, is, this is what's important here, is being able to, to, to communicate in a way that makes sense to say, this is the game that we're going to be playing, and here's why we're playing it, and this and that and the other. Some games you say, well, there's no review for this game because we've never seen it before, as we talked about. But other games you're like, this is my favorite game, and here's why. And if you get so into the passionate, like, oh my god, here's what I love about this game, <laughs> you're not actually communicating anything useful um, in terms other than, this game is fun, I guess, to me. Corollary. If you find that your friends very rarely want to play the game that you suggest, you're probably, to be really honest, you're probably reviewing the games very poorly. You're probably expressing the wrong things about the game, so your friends have been burned by you. 
I mean, I've done that before. I've found friends who don't want to play games that I suggest just because I've described the games in a way that turned them off, or I described the game that they would love, and then the game wasn't that. Right. So you reviewing has a direct impact on you playing. Yeah, that's why it's very true that the most important game reviewer in your friend's life is you. Yeah. I, I don't ever think otherwise. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have a lot of impact on what people oh, yeah. choose to play. Uh, no, let's go. What's the next, next topic? Right. Moving on. Moving on. So, uh, we're going to take a couple minutes and we're going to talk about uh, finding starter games. We're going to talk just a minute about some of our favorite games, what we think. Maybe you favorite, should take to your friends. Favorite starter games or favorite games? Starter games. Starter, starter games? games? I, think you have games like five. I don't have any favorite games. Um, uh, Carcassonne. Carcassonne is a super great starter game. Carcassonne? Yeah. yeah. That's Our a super song. great starter game. Because you're like, here's like the four rules you need to know. There's farmers, this is your first game, don't super worry about farmers, it's probably how I'm gonna win to ignore that. Um, <laughs> and, but then like, look, you put your dudes on the roads, so there's a road dudes, so they have some name. You put your dudes in the city, there's a city dudes, so they've got some name too. And it's gonna be fine, and you're gonna put these chits down, and they look super cool, and the tiles are fun. And at the end of the game, I guess we'll count up points, but hey, let's just play this damn game and stop talking about the rules now. And then after you played it once, it's like, oh, that was fun, I'm gonna do it again, okay, cool. Carcassonne's very good. But my number one is Tesoro. Oh, Tesoro. Tesoro is yeah. 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 definitely a good starter game. Tesoro is a great game. Well, it has. Tesoro is fun because it is. It's largely random, but you can mitigate the randomness by being smart. But even if you play it very poorly, you're still engaged through most of the game. It's fun. It's quick. So if you get eliminated, the game is over a couple minutes later. You don't feel left out. And the game has. I've heard this term a couple of times just in the last few weeks. It has an ego shield. The good starter games are the games where a player who learns the game and loses has some form of ego shield. I'm not dumb, I just didn't understand the game that well. Uh, I'm not dumb, the game had some randomness. Some sort of way to, like Puerto Rico, a German game that is my favorite, one of my favorite board games ever, is a terrible starter game because it is the sum of the decisions you make. If you lose, there is literally no way to escape the fact that you made poor decisions the entire time. And <laughs> or or work as far as the other people at the table. Yeah, might be true. But yeah. as a result, if you learn that game first, it's very easy for us to forget that oh, I didn't know the rules that well. It's very easy for us to think, wow, I'm dumber than all my friends, and start feeling bad. This is downward spiral. The starter games are good games where the people who lose don't feel that bad about it, and the people who win don't have an excuse to rub it in their face. They can be like, I'm the best at Suro for some weird reason. Like, the, by the way, the game that we were talking about is Suro. I saw some people going to like, like, Suro, Suro. Yeah, and it's, it's super good. You should look it up. So yeah. we're talking about starter board games, card games, Suro, rolling games. Well, there's this little game called Dragon Age. <laughs> <laughs> And so what's really great is there are a lot of people that are doing and uh, that are doing starter kits where you don't even have to know. Like when Chris wrote Dragon Age, he wrote this. The, the team that all got together and wrote this. They made it of if you have never been a GM in your life, here's this box and all this stuff in here in this one little box. It will tell you how to handle problem players, what kind of players, um, how to set up a game, how to keep track of everything. I mean, there's some good games that are doing that and. Um, I mean, that's, that's right there is my I, favorite. I can thing. think of one off the top of my head. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're an RPGer and you want to bring your friends into RPGing, or if, you're, um, or if you just want to start playing role-playing games, you might have heard of a game called Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, you should play this game. Everyone in this room should play this game. Even if you never want to play an RPG in your life, Dungeons & Dragons is um, it's an amazing game. The new edition uh, looks great, mm -hmm. uh, but it really sit down and play any, any books that you can get your hands on. Uh, this game changed the world. Yep. Not, we wouldn't be here yeah. and, and, uh, without this game. Things like little things that we just take for granted, like levels and hit points and classes, like things that are in mages only cast four level one spells right now. Yeah, spell selection, armor class, uh, you know, probabilities to hit, persistent characters, uh, tiny things like that uh, that exist well outside of the, the realm of role playing games uh, at this point. Figure it out. Sit down and play that game and find the magic in there. There's tons. There's so much, so much good in that game. Even if you're like, eh, it wasn't for me. Uh, you'll just have a different perspective on games and gameplay. Um, and uh, and honestly, you're more than likely to have fun. It's a great fun. Yeah. Game. Well, Nobody we has problems. There's uh, story games. Like, we haven't even talked about story games. Sure. You know, which you don't. You know, you basically you know have a facilitator that kind of you build the story together. So you don't need the dice and you don't need that if that's not really your thing. Well, and then Storium. If you yeah. want to start around that, I would, the game I would recommend, if you want to take someone who's never played a role-playing game before, independent of Dungeons & Dragons, which even if you hate it, as Luke was saying, it's really important to have played mm -hmm. it to see that yeah. context. It's like watching Citizen Kane. You might think it's the most boring movie in the world, but it changed cinema. You have yep. to know about it. 
Lady Blackbird is free. Oh, it's a Lady Blackbird is fantastic. Role game. You can download the rules online, it's just a PDF. And it has pre made characters, a pre made setting. It starts in Media Res and it ends in Media Res. Just print it out, pass it out, pick somebody to the Game Master, and you read the, the rules. And it says, like, your ship, the whatever, is on the run from the pirate whatever. You've been captured by the Imperial Dreadnought Hand of Sorrow. And then it starts you in the prison. What do you do? Tell a story, go nuts. You can learn this game, your Game Master can learn this game in 10 minutes. You can start playing within 15 minutes, and you can have a session that's done that you could turn into a movie within two hours. Yeah, uh, Steve Kenson's Icons superhero role playing. He just uh, we just republished it. Um, it is fantastic. So if you're not getting like in the full Mutants of Masterminds or full you know other superhero games, um, is that Icons is really quick to build characters and play, uh, so you can play a lot more kind of casually. It's good if for a gaming group that wants to maybe invite new people in. I'm doing one, like next year at Gen Con, I'm doing Sailor Moon versions of it. So, you know, because it's a great system to do that kind of, you know, in the name of the moon, I will punish you. If you've never played, so we, we talk about like, oh, you're trying to get new players in. If you have a gaming group and your gaming group plays a lot of board games or card games or video games or whatever, but you've never actually played a tabletop game, a game that I think, and I, I might get people to disagree with me, but I get a game that I think is a really good way to say, hey, we've never done anything before. Let's just take, you know, the one or two books we need for this, learn them and do that from scratch is uh, Fate Core Accelerated, mm -hmm. um, which just, it, 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 you could take anybody who had no idea of any of the things we've been talking about and said, just read this book and do what it says and have fun, and they're gonna have fun. Like, Fate Core Accelerated is a great way to, to jump into the world of, of tabletop RPGs, I think. Okay, so we talked a lot. Let's take some questions. We've got about 10 minutes. Do we have a, do we we have a question mic? Do we have a, mic? Do we have a question mic? Oh, here he goes, this question guy, he's gonna pass around. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, that's, no, you, do we have an enforcer? Oh no. Yay, enforcers. Now, we don't have a lot of time, so please don't try to like. Bye, everybody. Concise. If I ask a concise question, there's no more than two pieces of punctuation. Can we talk more about how to review games critically? Sure, yes, we can. Next question. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad somebody asked me a question that could do that jerk answer. So, um, certainly, I think that uh, if you want to step back and review games critically, you need to be able to talk about the mechanics a little bit. You want to be able to. When you are outlining what you want to talk about, you need to make sure that you are explaining not just what happens in the game, like if you do this and you put your worker down and you get three wood and you trade it to your friend for sheep. You need to also be able to say it feels like this to play the game. Um, the value in uh, written criticism tends to be not from a simple overview of what the game is, but what the game does. Right, and, and to, to expand on that, I actually, when I'm reading a review or any kind of criticism of a game, I want to know about you. I want to know about the games that you like, what your perspective is, I want to know where you live. I'm a jerk who has no friends. I play games that make people cry. Yeah, well, that's, my that's, that's, right. that's grim. <laughs> but it's, seriously, like, it's, you're, like, I know it's an opinion, so I want to know more about the, the perspective of the opinion. I write much less about the, uh, the, the individual game mechanics. I want to know a little bit about how the game plays. But tell, tell me where you're coming from with this game and other games that you liked, other games you didn't like. So I'm not so much interested in, sorry. I'm, I'm not so much interested in how to convey a review to an audience. I'm interested in how to critically analyze the game. Like, the way that we sure, I would. Oh, sure. Okay, yeah, sorry. Play I would. Games. Seriously, play a lot of games. Sure. I spent the summer playing a game called Puerto Rico and three or four other games five or six times a day, every day for three months. Uh -huh. I play board games all the time. Video games, the more games you play, that is the fastest way to start to understand it is like, how games work, like what's important about a game, like not learning to not focus on the things that actually don't matter to you. Yeah. The other thing is I would break things into categories, um, like pros and cons, sure, but even deeper beyond that and say, okay, you know, this is in this realm, for this type of game, it just works this way. And the more things, that, the more different categories you can break the things into and the more like, okay, like analyze the game on these levels and on, on deeper levels and on shallower levels and all those things, that's going to help you get a feeling for, okay, this is how this game is put together and the way the game is put together versus or sometimes in conjunction with the feeling of the game, um, like that's... It, Whenever I'm working on any sort of game, it's really breaking it down into how it works on various levels. And so hopefully that's helpful. Very good news. Let's chat out the family. It's yeah. called uh, Characters of Games by Richard Marco and other people. Don't use any of the words in that book in a review, but read the book and understand what those words mean. Sorry. So, in terms of rules and everything, you fall asleep and you like getting everything. So, 
I've had situations where you try to explain the rules, and then for simplicity or for the development, there's a rule again that changes the way the game would have been played, and then people get upset. So where do you like? Do you do you bring that up when it comes up, and then the people who had a chance and maybe didn't know that that rule get a little screwed over, or do you like how do you manage that? Yeah, for my groups, if we all of a sudden realize, you know, because like somebody is still reading the rules and then they go, oh, we just go, whoops, and we start over. Yeah, or I mean, if you want to keep playing, just gloss over it and be like, oh, yeah, we did that wrong. Like, no, well, we'll, we'll do it, do it next time. time. We'll, we're we'll, still having a fun time. The, yeah. Is the point of playing games playing games right or playing games with friends for fun? I mean, right. that's or like, right. Right. Then, 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 you, then you start <laughs> over. If that's, just, if that's well, just we use a trick. We call it the asterisk. If a game messes up and like someone, like a friend of ours who was new to the game, loses because they, they glossed over the farmer rules in Carcassonne, and, and then they get really mad about it, what we say is, oh, you didn't understand that rule. There's an asterisk next to this game, like, you know, when a football player uses steroids or something. So we say there's an asterisk in the record. So we say, yes, I won, but we, we recognize that this was not a good play of the game. I found that that is like the most powerful way in the world to soothe everyone's anger. But so yeah, and I, also like, especially if it's a first game demo game, don't be afraid to rewind, like retcon a few turns and say, okay, would you have made a different decision here if you had known that and play from there? Like it can't hurt. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, I like playing role playing games, video games, and whatnot. And I joined the D and D group of a coworker that had been playing for two years. Um, the first time playing, he didn't teach me well enough on making a character, and I felt really confused because there's a lot going into building a character. Sure, sure. And bad. How do you approach someone that has never played it and making a character? Because for me, that was the hardest part. I sit Unless down one on one. I sit down and want to uh, make sure they understand the world that they're joining because, you know, uh, if you're making a character for Forgotten Realms, it's going to be different how you make a character for uh, Eberron, yeah. this example. And if you, if you really like your character you have now, see about rebuilding it. If you don't, that character can die and you can be somebody else. Like, yeah. Yeah. You're serious, I mean, like seriously, or, or die or go on a ship to, on a, jo a journey or decide to become a farmer, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But like, there, it, I throw down my arms. Right, whatever. But so like, if, if you're playing a game for a while and you're like, you go, gosh, I'm just not having fun with this anymore. What's the, what's the point if you're not having fun? Anymore? Well, there's was fun with it, but the other players made poor decisions as eventually my character died because of poor Great. decisions. New character died. So I had to remake another character and it was at that point that I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Okay. Because within a month, my character died, not because of my decision. Sure, but, but you've learned something about yourself. You should role playing game player, you should always feel comfortable asking the game master, just like, hey, I don't really know how to do this. Can you make my character, can you make a character for me? Can you, uh, or with me? Or with you. Yeah, Most people aren't complete jerks um, and will we'll make time to help to figure out the system uh, if you find another that you want to play with. Yeah, it's super hard to ask for help in these situations, but remember that you're not making a lifelong commitment to this. You're not marrying that character. Seriously, like, don't don't be afraid to play for a few weeks and be like, uh, I made this wrong. Um, you might put a tattoo of your favorite character on your arm, well, so it could be a lifelong. But seriously, commitment. don't don't be afraid to to restart and, and try to focus on what you prefer, and because. Games of sufficient complexity, whether it's a role-playing game or any other game, you're just not going to be able to know everything your first time out. So don't be afraid to admit that and, and start again. Yeah, he's a exactly right. Yeah. Um, do we? Is that it? We got to go. That's all we got. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We'll answer other questions out in the hallway. Yay! Yay!